was the year 712 AD when Ono Yasmaro, by command of the emperor, put in writing word of mouth. In this chronicle of ancient events, known as the Kojiki, we find that swords played a prominent role in the lives of the mythical gods, or kami, as the Japanese refer to them. The Kojiki tells us that one of the highest of these kami, Susano no Mikoto, slew an eight-headed dragon. With the dragon dead, his tail the most important blade of all. Legend tells us that this very same blade was later used by Yamato Takeru no Mikoto as he passed over the plains of Yaizu, located in what today is the Japanese prefecture of Shizuoka. His enemies hid in ambush as he approached. Then, at a given signal, they set fire to the grass, hoping to burn the prince to death. Quickly, the prince unsheathed his sword and mowed down the grass around him. At this, the fire changed direction and made his adversaries flee in fright for their lives. Even today, this sword carries the name grass mower and is enshrined in the Asta Shrine near Nagoya, Japan. It is the second of the three sacred symbols of Shinto, once the national religion of Japan. The earliest known swords, other than those of the mythical gods, are found in the dolmens or tombs of the ancient Yamato people, who are believed to have inhabited Japan between the 2nd and 8th centuries AD. As Japan developed, so did the sword. Even blades produced over a thousand years ago had attained a high standard of quality. This quality continued to improve up to and during the Kamakura period from 1190 until 1337, the beginning of Japan's Middle Ages. It was during this era the sword reached its peak of perfection. Its quality has never been surpassed to this day. Because of the ever higher esteem placed on these blades, there slowly evolved around them a kind of mystical veneration. In fact, Ieyasu Tokugawa, one of the most influential leaders in Japanese history, wrote in his legacy, the girded sword is the living soul of the samurai. The samurai were among the ruling classes of Japan, lower in rank only to the imperial family and the feudal lords of the provinces. Theirs was a life of great responsibility, not only to themselves, to the liege lord they were pledged to serve, but also to the common people they were pledged to protect. We find almost exact parallels can be drawn between these samurai and the Christian knights of the Western world's Middle Ages. The Arthurian knight held sacred any oath he made upon his sword. Since its hilt formed a cross, any vow made upon it was to him the same as swearing on the holy cross itself. A samurai, in practicing his moral code, known as Bushido, felt this same kind of reverence toward his sword. It was not only a weapon of war, but was also a symbol of great moral and religious responsibility. Between the samurai and its blade was formed a binding spiritual union of man and steel. Next to his honor, a samurai warrior considered his blade his most valued possession. A samurai cleaned his sword daily. He would polish it with rice paper to prevent any possible stains or rust. An honorable samurai embodied in his sword the supreme concept of honor and manhood. He looked on it as a mirror of his soul. He felt it reflected his true nature and the spirit of his personality, and was aware that through it, people would be quick to judge his character. He would go to the shrine daily and pray that his sword would remain untarnished, and that he would use it only as a strict code of the blade might demand thereby keeping his soul as he wants all to know it. For a samurai to break this code of the blade could mean only disgrace or death. Still under the spell of the shrine, a samurai pauses at a swordsmith's gate. The sounds reaching his ears make him aware of the religious ritual that is beginning behind the closed doors of the forge. 
The Smiths, dressed in their ceremonial robes, begin their work with prayers and offerings, asking the Shinto God of Swords that they be purified and made worthy of the task which lies before them. They pray the blade they are about to produce will be as close to perfection as is humanly possible, and with the God's aid, may even approach in quality and spirituality that greatest blade of all, grass mower. These prayers are said with all fervor. At last, ready physically and spiritually, the smiths light the forge from the altar. It may take them months or even years to complete a single blade. The smiths are fully aware that they are about to produce more than a weapon. They are producing a soul in steel, a symbol that will guide some young, eager samurai throughout his life. What they cannot realize is the strong moral influence this blade will have not only on this young samurai, but also on countless other men for many generations to come. With the forge built up to the proper temperature, the master smith and his two assistants begin the actual work by heating and hammering separately the three types of iron ore needed in creating a blade. The ores are worked over and over. During this process, the carbon content of each is carefully controlled, adding carbon in one case and removing it in the others. This, at a later stage, is an important factor in producing the various parts of the blade. Each type of them flattened and broken into small pieces. These pieces, placed on a spatula in various combinations, will produce metals of different characteristics when again fused into one. This process also removes any remaining impurities. The completed puzzle is then covered with straw ash and a watery clay. This covering, like the lid on a frying pan, helps keep a constant heat throughout the steel as it is being worked. This firing and refiring of the various combinations will be repeated again and again. The master's disciples help him pound and fold the metal repeating the process several times until the texture is even throughout and the quality of steel desired for each type is obtained. This method of hammering, doubling back, and forge welding, practiced since prehistoric times, draws out all flaws. The toughness of the finished product is controlled by how many times the bar is hammered out and welded back on itself. The smiths have employed the most laborious and best methods known to produce the several different types of steel. Now, one steel will be hammered into the fine cutting edge. The others will form the back, the core, and the handle of the blade. Another will be produced, which will eventually bind the others together into the finished masterpiece, and the whole will be polished to a mirror-like sheet. is long and arduous. It demands the absolute devotion of the smiths, as well as all the artistic talent their hands and minds can give. Strained from concentration, the master prays silently, again asking the gods' guidance in this exacting task. His mind recalls the legend of Kokaji, one of Japan's greatest sword makers. One day long ago, Kokaji was brought before the Emperor's Chamberlain 
and was presented an imperial proclamation telling him of a dream the emperor had about a magnificent sword. He was reminded how it was well known that only he, Kokaji, could possibly make a sword that would be worthy of duplicating the emperor's dream. Poor Kokaji, having been commanded by the emperor to make such a blade, shut himself up in his forge to pray. He prayed for many days, asking the gods to enlighten him. Where, he asked them, will I ever be able to find an assistant skillful enough to help me in such a monumental task? The gods, hearing his prayer and thinking him worthy, agreed that one of them should appear and be his assistant. God inscribed Kokaji's name and then his own, Kogitsune, or Little Fox, upon the handle. In honor of the gods, this sword has always been known as the Little Fox Blade. This legend has been an inspiration to all Japanese swordsmiths, and the story was quick to find a permanent place in the repertoire of the Japanese theater. With the metal again heated to the required temperature, the master smith's mind returns to the work at hand. Now fused, the hole is refined and fired some 13 times. It is then lengthened and refined even more as it is slowly shaped into a rod. This rod the smiths have so painstakingly formed is now cut at 50 centimeters, or approximately 20 inches. Then it is cooled, weighed, and inspected for flaws. Now the decision must be made. Is this blade worth continuing, or must it be scrapped and the whole process begun again? After careful inspection, the master feels he is, at this point, on the way to producing a fine blade. So he attaches the steel manufactured for the handle to the main rod and continues the shaping process. Then the tip or point of the blade is formed. The work of firing and hammering is repeated as the rod is slowly stretched to the length of the finished blade. Now the smith will take the rod to a vise where he shaves and files it into the first rough form of a blade. When this step has been completed, it will be taken to the grinding stone where all the rough edges will be smoothed away. Then the master smith will retire to another building to prepare the blade for tempering. Here in a spotlessly clean room, the master will cover the blade with various layers of clay, which he blends according to his own secret formulas. Slowly, meticulously, the clays will be applied in a prescribed manner which has been used by the master's family for generations. This extreme secretiveness has been the biggest obstacle in the development of the sword maker's art. A master smith would not even tell his eldest son, who would carry on his work, the most intricate parts of his formula until he lay on his deathbed. 
If he died unexpectedly, his secrets died with him, and his son could only experiment until he too found the right combinations. Of all the secret processes, probably the most closely guarded is the tempering for which the blade is now being prepared. During the final tempering, the clay-covered blade will be once again subjected to fire and water. At this time, the steel will become extremely hard along the cutting edge where the clay is thinnest. If the blade is sharpened and cared for correctly, this fine edge will remain long beyond the life of its owner. At the same time, the thicker layers of clay will cause the remainder of the blade to retain a certain amount of softness and flexibility. While the master is preparing the blade, his assistants are readying the forge. The fire pit is thoroughly cleaned but some of the fire originally started from the altar candle is carefully set aside to be used in lighting the new charcoal. The charcoal used in tempering will be cut much smaller than that used for the other processes. It requires three years of training for an apprentice smith to learn just this seemingly simple charcoal cutting process. Quick and nimble hands are needed for this job, and an even quicker eye. One slip could mean the loss of a finger. The moment of truth for this particular blade is moving ever closer. The tension seems to rise in direct proportion to the heat from the new fire. Traditionally, the final tempering is done at midnight. This is actually based on the sound scientific rule, which says that one of the best ways to judge when steel is ready for tempering is by its color when seen in complete darkness. As the fateful moment approaches, the only sounds heard are the snap of the fire and the sigh of the bellows. With a silent prayer on his lips, the smith takes the blade from the coals. Then... <laughs> through the smith's mind races the question, what do I have? A piece of art worthy of my name, or only a piece of junk steel for the scrap heap? It looks good. But only after the clay is removed and the blade inspected will he really know for sure. It is an anxious moment for everyone. Master Smith smiles his approval. The blade has passed his critical inspection. Now the work can be completed. The curve is corrected by lightly tapping the blade on a heated block of grooved copper. Now it is time for the finishing touches. First, the handle will be filed in a definite design. Each smith's own filing pattern, which makes identification of even the oldest blades relatively easy for an expert appraiser. The blade will be given one more polishing by the master smith himself. Any further polishing will be done by still another artist, especially trained for this job. Finally, with great pride, the master smith will chisel on the handle, his name, and the name of the province in which the blade is made. 
the work is finished. Its first owner wore it proudly and with honor. It was then handed down from generation to generation, even beyond the age of the samurai, which ended shortly after Japan was opened to the Western world by the arrival of Commodore Perry in 1853. Suddenly the Japanese people became obsessed with all things Western, and the samurai warrior, the living symbol of the feudal past the Japanese were trying to escape, was slowly stripped of the emblems of his class until even the wearing of the sword became illegal. Banned by law, the samurai and his sword faded into the background. In 1926, Japan entered the Showa era when the sword was worn again during the Second World War. It was at this time the Western world became aware of these blades as servicemen brought them home to America as war souvenirs. This association in Western minds with the war years caused us to think of the blades only as weapons of war. Perhaps now, however, it is a little clearer to us that the samurai and their swords were in truth as strong a moral force in their world as were our Christian knights in theirs. Today, the samurai is only a memory but his soul still lives in the thoughts of all who look at these blades in a museum, a private collection, or rusting away in the attic of one who little realizes what he has in his possession. A sword of itself is more than a weapon of war, a symbol of morality, or even an artistic masterpiece. The realization of its true purpose can come only from the spirit and the soul of the beholder. <laughs>